and uh, this is a really important um, <clears throat> thing to not only believe in and understand, but it's really important to know how to apply it. If, if you know what it means to be justified and you think about it and meditate on it, it will bring a whole new level of peace to you. It will bring a whole new level of confidence to you. But I, I would dare to say that probably in a room this size, with people, of course, watching, you know, uh, online, that there are a number of people here that probably have a poor understanding of the scope of justification or possibly are confused about exactly what it means or even possibly have a, a view, but it's not the full extent of what the Bible teaches about it. And when you think about justification, one of the simplest things people say is, well, it's just as if I never sinned. And that is part of it, but that's not the, the full scope of that. So tonight, I hope when you leave here, you're going to have a, a better understanding of what it means to be justified as a Christian. So let's pray, ask God to uh, be with us, and then let's get into his word together. Father, we thank you tonight for your son, Jesus. We thank you that we have been acquitted of our sin and we're blameless before you because of his blood. We thank you that we can have peace with you. We can have joy in our hearts that we can be reconciled to you, to stand safe and secure before you, um, to have quiet confidence and hope about the future, to know that we can experience your excellence and your power, that even during times of suffering, Lord, you can produce really good things when we have that fact that we know we're right with you in our minds. We thank you that you've revealed your great love to us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that makes us right with you. We thank you especially that we are saved from wrath. No wrath. What a, what a comfort, Father. And we pray that we would continue to be able to live the Christian life in a fuller way because of these truths. Thank you for praising in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The other Bible is open to Romans chapter 5. Uh, it says Romans 3 there, which is where I originally was going to go, but Romans 5 um, can consolidate it a little bit. Um, one of the things you have to understand is that the word justification is not necessarily a spiritual word or a biblical word. Actually, in the writings of Paul, he borrowed it from the courts. It was a judicial term, okay? And in the technical side, if somebody is justified in a courtroom, it means it's not being declared not guilty. That's not what it is, okay? That's something different. When you go through a court, there's testimony, and then they weigh the facts, and you're determined whether you're guilty or innocent. That's not what justification is. It might be a little part of it. But what it is, is the judge looking at you and declaring that you're completely innocent of everything. There's not even any charges, there's no testimony needed, nothing. You're just completely innocent before him. And that as far as he's concerned, when you take the law, you haven't violated it at all. Isn't that amazing? That God could look at, it, look at us like that, see us that way. And there's a lot of comfort and a lot of just almost parent-child feelings when you sit there and think, that's how your dad looks at you. Um, in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, I'm going to read it tonight, but I'm going to read out of the Amplified Version of the Bible. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's louder, it just means it's expanded a little bit more. Okay? Yeah, bummer. Okay? I heard a guy one time who said, I'd like to read out of the Amplified Bible, and he goes, therefore, sis! And I'm not going to do that tonight, okay? <laughs> But this is uh, Romans 5, 1 through 11, okay? It says, Therefore, since we have been justified, that is, acquitted of sin and declared righteous before God by faith, let us grasp that fact, that we have peace with God, and the joy of being reconciled with Him, through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah and Anointed One. Through Him, we also have access by faith into this remarkable state of grace, in which we firmly and safely and securely stand. Let us rejoice in our hope and in the confident assurance of experiencing and enjoying the glory of our great God, the manifestation of his excellence and his power. And not only this, 
But with joy, let us exult in our times of suffering and rejoice in our hardships, knowing that hardship produces patience, and patience produces endurance, and endurance proves your character or spiritual maturity, and proven character produces hope and confident assurance of our salvation. Such hope in God's promises never disappoints us. The God's love has been abundantly poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. While we were still powerless and unable to provide salvation, at the right time Christ came and died to substitute for the ungodly. Now this is an extraordinary thing. For no one is willing to give up his life, even for an upright man. Though perhaps for a good man, somebody who's noble and selfless and worthy, someone might dare to die. But God clearly shows and proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, since we have now been justified, declared free of guilt from sin by his blood, how much more certain is it that we'll be saved from the wrath through him? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, it is much more certain, having been reconciled, that we will be saved from the consequences of sin by his life. That is, we will be saved because Christ lives today. Not only that, but we also rejoice, rejoicing in his love and perfection through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received and enjoy our reconciliation with God. And that a great passage of scripture. And I just love the way that they phrase it here because it really tells us about the scope of what happens when you're in right relationship with God. So again, we gave a legal definition of what justification is. In this, it basically defines justification as, as being acquitted of sin and being declared um, blameless before God. That's what to be justified is. And it's important that you understand that justification fits in in a certain sequence of events um, in the life of a believer. And as we started in the beginning talking about the Word of God and then going to, you know, the attributes of God and the Gospel, and then we started talking about the elements of the Gospel, and last week about the Atonement, in a time sequence, all of those things have to precede justification. If you have not been atoned for, you will not be justified. Okay, so you understand? So in a sense, we've taught things sequentially. So last week we talked about being covered by the blood of Christ and being declared sinless. Now, justification is the state that you live in after you've been atoned. So God just looks at you and he just sees uh, a clean baby. He sees really spiritual perfection. Now, the thing about the gospel and everything of all characteristics of the gospel is they are always gifts. Did you know that? Everything that God gives to you is a gift. You don't have to earn anything in salvation or in life or any of those things. And one of the problems that we have, especially as adults, is we don't know how to receive gifts the right way. We can say we receive the gifts from God, but we never take ownership of them. It's almost like we believe that he gave us those gifts, but it's almost like, uh, maybe he'll just take this back or I'm going to lose it. And I heard a speaker one time said, we need to have the attitude of a five-year-old. When a five-year-old shows up at his birthday party, does he have any problem understanding that these gifts are free and these gifts are his? None, right? Now, even if the kid was disciplined the day before, and there was tension and he got punished and things like that. If they have the birthday party, is that going to affect him recognizing that these gifts are free and that he's going to have ownership of them? No. So when we talk about justification tonight, don't sit there and say, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I, I have that. Say, no, I'm going to receive it and take ownership of it. Because when you do that, then the gift really, really takes on its full value. So here's a quiz. Are you a Christian? Now, that may not be that complicated of a question, but you'd be surprised how many Christians have a hard time really answering that question correctly. Like um, in fact, the answer that most people in church would give to you if you ask them, are they a Christian, 
would not line up with what we've studied over the last six or seven weeks. It wouldn't. And so one of the important things is to understand this is what does it mean to be a Christian, which we've been talking about. But secondly, how do you know you are a Christian? How do you know? Do you believe you can know? Yes. Absolutely. And not only can you know, but you can have confirmed. All right, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, there's a verse that says this. These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may know and continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. You can know you're saved. You can know you're atoned for. You can know you have eternal life. You can know you have the Spirit. You can know and have confidence in God. In the New Testament, the word know or to know is used 625 times. It's one of the most popular words among the writers of the New Testament. And the Bible says that when you know God, first of all, you're free from fear and judgment. Remember we talked about that last week? Also, you can have assurance. When you know the things that you know, if you believe them, that's one thing, but if you know them, you can be assured of them. So, take an example, I believe God answers prayer. You can know that, but it really changes when you're assured of it. Um, in Titus, we can know that we're heirs of God. Remember, we've talked about that. We become his adopted children and we become heirs. This is just like a review of, of earlier things. Um, last week and the week before we talked about Jesus and the atonement, we realized that Jesus is completely just and right and holy and perfect and that he has the right to be approached because he is God's son, he's loving, but he's also just. And so therefore he can represent us before God. And we can have confidence that Jesus represents us well before God. We can also have confidence that the law doesn't condemn us anymore. And that is a big one that most people wrestle with. They say they're Christians, but they still feel condemned all the time. You can know that you're not condemned by the law. The law was not meant to condemn Christians. It was meant to point out to us two things after we become a Christian. Number one, to teach us things. And then number two, to rebuke us or to point out where we've gotten off course, but never to produce condemnation. We can know peace with God. Have you ever met people that have had that peace that passes understanding? Have you ever had it? You had peace in a situation, you're going, this just doesn't make sense. I should be freaking out right now, but all of a sudden God just puts this layer of peace there. That's a known peace, and that could be the peace that we do know. It says, how do you know you're a Christian? We have to go back to remember that no one is declared just or right with God um, by doing or satisfying the law. I know that's redundant, but I have to say that first, okay? And what that means is, is that we take all the pressure off of ourselves of performance, and we focus more on being a believer than doing Christianity, okay? Dave and Sarah know we pounded it in every year with the mission ships, didn't it? What was our phrase? Being, not doing. Being, not doing. And that is one of the hardest things for Christians to do, is to be a Christian and not do Christianity. I've told some of you the story before. We go on mission trips, and we have a day where we load the kids up in a van, and we pull up to a park, we open the door, and we didn't tell them what to do. We just said, go, you're going to be in the park all day. And uh, what do you think their question is? What are we going to do? And I said, I don't care what you do, just be a Christian. And what do you think they asked me? How do you do that? <laughs> we have people who have been Christians for years and years and years and years, and you say, be a Christian. They go, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> it just should be a natural thing for us to live. But that's one of the beautiful things about being justified is the pressure is then you are just justified and you operate in that rather than trying to all the time do things that are going to earn some kind of approval from God. <coughs> Excuse me. It says below that, Romans 3.21, foolishness. It is stupid to try to pursue to be good enough before God. Justified means to be just before God. It is stupid to think that by doing good things, you can achieve that. 
Do you remember in uh, Matthew 19 and Luke 18, uh, the rich young guy came to Jesus? And he says, Rabbi, how do, I, how do I please God? And he says, obey the commandments. And what does the rich guy say? Since I was a little fellow, I've kept all those commandments. And I would love to see Jesus' facial expression like that. Um, but Jesus sits there and says, okay, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then, then you'll be right before God. Now, did he really mean that? No. But he knew that the guy hadn't kept the other Ten Commandments, and he knew that this guy had a root problem in his life of a specific sin. And, and the sin expressed by Calvin was he feared poverty, he feared obscurity, and he feared humility. And so he thought that he had done a really good job at obeying the law, and all he had to do was tweak it a little bit, and he would be just before God. And what Jesus was basically saying to him was, is, you know what, you haven't met any of them. You know, it is really easy if you redefine the law or the laws of God to keep them. Did you hear that? It's really easy if you redefine them to keep them. And that's what most people do. They lower the bar. In other words, God's bar is up here. Okay? A standard is up here. And what we do is we lower that standard. I don't have to be this 100% of the time, but most of the time. I don't have to be completely honest, but mostly honest. I don't have to be completely clear in my thought life, but I can you know, be really good at it. Now, what would you think of a high jumper who put a bar this high and says, I've never missed a high jump. And I've jumped it 100 times a day and I've never missed. He could brag all he wanted, but if you saw him doing it, would you have any respect for him at all? No, he's not even really a high jumper. He's just a jumper. <laughs> and as Christians, we've got to be really careful that when we look at the law, we don't come up with our own version of what keeping that law is because we're always going to draw a bar lower than what God wants. And so we can feel justified and good about ourselves going over it, and God looks down and says, well, no, nice try, but you are not meeting the requirements of the law. If anything, you're proving to me over and over again that you can't. So it says, the law cannot give us just standing with God. But there are things that all of us try in our lives to do to justify ourselves before God. Now I'm talking primarily to Christians tonight. There might be a couple of people here that don't know Christ as their personal Savior. There might be somebody listening that doesn't know Christ as their personal Savior. But this is directed primarily to Christians, but it applies to non-Christians. There are things we try to do to justify ourselves before God, and they go into three categories. Number one is religious experiences. People feel that if they've had some type of religious experience with God that's out of the norm or is emotional, that somehow now they are magically right with God. Okay? Now, if that is the salvation experience and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's true. But most religious experiences really are nothing more than emotion. Okay? The most predominant one is confirmation. Any of you gone through confirmation classes in your denomination or your church? Okay, confirmation classes are designed for you go to, through a period of training, you go through the period of the training, you complete the course, they stamp for approval, and you're a Christian. That's what confirmation, and that's a very simple explanation of it. But I want to give you uh, a little bit of background on confirmation to help you to understand it. All right? First of all, the road to confirmation starts when the baby is baptized as an infant, generally. Okay? Now, many of you believe that the, the infant baptism started during times when the infant mortality rate was huge. So you can understand why they wanted to baptize babies to dedicate them to Christ at an early age. But then the church adopted it as part of or making it a sacrament, just like uh, the Lord's Supper or um, you know, baptism. Then, after that point, they would begin a series of classes. And they would be taught by elders and leaders and pre-described teachers in the church. And you had to go through it for a number of years. Then you came to a point when you have successfully graduated, you are confirmed. Now, most denominations teach this, that it's at that point you receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
It's at that point that all of a sudden God will undo you with a wisdom that you did not have before. You'll have understanding and knowledge. You'll have a more pious outlook on life. And at that point you can begin to understand what it means to fear the Lord. At that time also they believe that is when generally the Holy Spirit indwells you or comes into your life. It's the time where the Great Commission then starts to become actually a commission for you. And then they anoint you with oil. And before they confirm you, they allow you to pick a new name. Did you know that? They allow you to pick a new name. And the name that you have to pick out is generally a Bible name. Okay? So everything is something that they do or something that you do. Even picking out a name. But if you read the Bible, the Bible says when we get to heaven, who's going to give us a new name? Christ is going to give us a new name. So can you understand in confirmation, even though some of the things that you're learning may be good, and the principles may be okay, it doesn't justify you. In fact, if anything, it can give you a false sense of justification. And I've led many people who went through confirmation and lived confirmed you know, for years and years and years and then came to know Christ and said, I didn't really understand any of it until the Holy Spirit explained it to me. So religious experiences and religious classes and things like that are things that sometimes people will say, yeah, I'm right with God, I'm justified with God because I'm confirmed, or because I went through this class, or because I have met this approval from my church. The second thing that people will do to justify themselves before God is comply. Comply with certain standards, comply with certain laws, comply with certain expectations. <coughs> there is nothing I think that would irritate God more than a person who is compliant to him. Do you know what compliance is? Compliance is when God tells you to do something, you do something, but your heart's not in it, but you do it anyway, because you're going to get rally points. Compliance is I obey the rules, I don't really have the motive in my heart to have this affect me or change me, I'm just going to do what you ask me to do, and if I do that, I'll be fine. Now, Robin is a full-time counselor. I'm a very part-time counselor, mainly because I'm really bad at it. Okay? I'm very direct and I'm very blunt. Like, she'd sit in a room for two hours and tell people all these wonderful things, and she would take the Scripture and the Holy Spirit. I would look at the person and go, Stop it! Stop doing it! That would be my counseling. So I've just probably eliminated any of you who ever come to me for counseling. Okay? But when you talk to men, and I think men, you'll understand this. Men deal better sometimes with, stop it. They don't need a story about a hillside or you know, anything like that. They just want to just say to stop it. But I've had to counsel pastors and fallen church leaders before. Okay? And so what I do is I'll work with them for months. And while I'm doing that, I'll sit there and I'll you know, have them do some exercises and do some homework and everything like that. And I tell you, I had this one guy that I worked with, he did everything I asked him to do in perfect handwriting, more than I asked, but his heart never changed at all. And he got to the end of this, um, this time with me that the denomination asked him to go through to be restored. And uh, they said, what do you think? And I said, well, he did everything that I asked him to do. And they said, oh, great, then you're recommending him. And I said, I wouldn't hire him. <laughs> but I said he did do everything that I asked him to do. And do you understand the danger of just being a person who feels that they're right with God because they comply? They comply to the rules, they comply to the image of people around them, they comply to expectation, but there's no heart change. That doesn't justify anything. The third thing, and this is the most obvious one, is people feel they're justified if they do more good than bad. Okay? Now, try that in court. Okay? You've been arrested for, I don't know, what's Dave been arrested for? Shoplifting. No, I don't know. Um, say a person's arrested for shoplifting, and, and they go into the court, and the judge, you know, they hear all the evidence and everything like that, and the judge says, do you have anything to say? And you say, you know what, I'd like you to get out the law books and I'd like you to start reading the entire law so I can tell you the ones I haven't broken. <laughs> What's the judge going to say? The court is not here 
And the law is not here to make you feel good about yourself and to talk about the things you haven't done. What's the law's purpose? To point out the things that you did wrong. Okay? And so when a Christian stands or a person tries to justify themselves by being good, what they want to do is take the areas that they don't struggle in and emphasize those and feel like if there's more of those that they're a good person. That is not justification on any level. But it can give a person a false sense of justification. Those things, religious experience, compliance to rules, and doing more good than bad, can never bring you atonement. Can never give you assurance. And will never produce rest. Most of the time, if you're going to be dealing with a Christian who is struggling with guilt, and remorse, and struggling with living the Christian life, it usually revolves around these issues. They're trying to do it in their own strength. And they've lost that insight into the fact that God needs to do this on the inside. Down below there it says, Holiness is what I long for. Do you know that song? Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. And then it goes on and it says, Take my heart and mold it. Take my mind, transform it. And take my will and conform it. Only when those things are done will you know that you're justified. When your heart and your will and your mind start to pursue after good things. Because there's a good heart beating in your chest. It says below that the law does not and cannot bring salvation the law is simply a list of what we should and we should not do. Did you ever look at the law? It's just simply a list of what you should and should not do. Is it hard to keep the Ten Commandments? It's not hard. It's impossible. I think that's why they took them out of schools and courtrooms and public places. Right? We can't do this. So we don't want to run. But if you break them down, what are the first four commandments about? Your relationship with, with God. What are they? No other gods. No idols. Don't take his name in vain. And don't break the Sabbath. Okay? The first four are about God. Those ones, I think, are the ones that irritate people the most. Okay? Now, the law was designed to talk about what God expects from you and to point where you're falling short. I came up with the illustration, it's like a golf coach, okay? Taking a guy that has never really golfed before and said, I'm going to teach you how to swing a golf club correctly. I know guys that have been golfing 30, 40 years and still haven't got their swing down, okay? And here's what a golf coach does, okay? Let me show you. So he shows you how to do it, and then you get up and you take a swing, he goes, no! So you get up and take a swing again, no! You take a swing again. Don't move your feet. No! It's, here's how to do it. Here's how to do it. Here's how to do it. Oh, come on! That's what it's like trying to keep the commandments towards God. Nice try, but you're always going to fall short. Then, the next commandments, 5 through 10, are about what? Our relationships with people. Okay? And you're probably familiar with those. Now, do we really need to go through commandments um, 5 through 10, one by one, to prove that we're not going to really prove ourselves good people by examining ourselves with those rules? I don't think so. Wouldn't we pretty much agree that if we really are honest, those commandments really kind of point out a lot of our flaws and a lot of our faults? But Jesus came in Matthew chapter 25, and he said this. Let me summarize it for you. Let me make it basic for you. There's basically two commands. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and spirit. What does that summarize? The first four commandments. Then he says, and then love your neighbor as yourself. What does that summarize? The rest of the commandments. Okay? Now, when he says love your neighbor as yourself, that's a phrase that a lot of people sometimes mix up because people say, I don't really love myself. I don't really like myself, you know. I have all these feelings about who I am. So let's put it on a more simplistic level. When you love your neighbor as you love yourself, you're willing to do the crude things to take care of your life so you survive. 
You go into a bathroom. There's a reason there's a door on bathrooms, right? Because that's not public in any sense. But in a sense, you're cleaning yourself or you're fixing yourself or whatever you're doing in there, treating yourself if you've got some kind of skin allergy or whatever. You're doing really crude things, but that's loving yourself. That's taking care of yourself. We were talking about this the other day, Jim, right? We love people by taking care of the crude and the hurt and doing things for people that are things that we do for ourselves but we have a hard time maybe imagine doing it for somebody else. So do you understand these crude things that we do to take care of ourselves like the bathroom things, the medical things, um, you know, when we do something really, really wrong, isn't it really easy to show ourselves mercy? That's loving yourself. But man, if somebody else blows it, man, we're all over them. That's the love that he's talking about, of loving yourself and loving other people the same way. Um, when we do something wrong, we can excuse it, but we'll pick up stones, verbal stones or glares or something like that when people have offended us or hurt us. But we don't hold ourselves to that another standard because we love ourselves more than that. So what Jesus was saying here is, is that if you're going to love somebody, that you first of all have to realize that we've become victims of a self-selfish love rather than distributors of a self-like love to other people. I want to repeat that because it's a little complicated. We've become victims of a self-selfish love rather than distributors of a self-like love to others. If you even look at that one standard, taking care of all these crude things and the standards about mercy and judgment that you have towards yourself, are you sharing those towards other people? And that one thing alone, we are not justified. And so Jesus wanted to make that point very, very clear. We are justified by Him alone, by His death, His atonement, His resurrection. It says, oh, I voiced jello there. I want you to think about your life and think about all these attributes of God that we've studied. And stand before God and put yourself as far as your sin in front of each one of those categories. As a sinner, would you want to stand in the presence of all power? No. He never changes. Do you want to stand before a God with all those standards and His standards don't change? Do you want to stand before a holy God? Of course not. Do you want to stand before a God who knows everything? Who is unlimited? Who rules over everything? Who is truth itself? Who is complete justice? Who has reigned for eternity? Who shines light? who loves, but yes, he also has to take into consideration all his other characteristics. And not only that, he's everywhere, everywhere. Can you imagine standing before a God like that and not being covered by atonement? Can you imagine if you ever just called us up there just for a brief meeting and said, I'd like to review your life. We would be on our faces flat on able to stand. And so... When we understand our sinful nature before this God, our spirit cries out, <laughs> I need to be justified. I, I can't make this right. This making right with you has got to come from outside of myself. And what Jesus provided makes sense. That's why anybody, once they understand atonement and they understand the effect of justification it has being made right, in front of all these attributes of God, how could you not but run to God and ask for His forgiveness and ask Him to save you? But what happens is, is as Christians, again, I think we start to look for loopholes in this system. We start to what I call, become what I call technical tenders, like the number 10. We look at those and we start to try to make them into some type of formula by which, if we obey them, we feel justified, even though we already are. 
So, in Exodus 20 are the Ten Commandments. That's a high standard, right? Can anybody meet it? No. But when you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Beatitudes in Jesus' teaching, does he raise or lower the bar of the Ten Commandments? He raises it. People sit there and say, oh, the Bible, you know, it's, it's the time of grace. And they always think, well, the, the Old Testament was so rigid and everything, like the standards back then were impossible. But maybe the standards of Jesus, it's just so much more relaxed and so much easier. Oh, really? Because in the Old Testament, what did he say? Don't have sex. Don't have sex outside of marriage. Period. It's wrong. Okay? What does he say in the New Testament? You've been looked upon a woman lustfully. You have committed adultery. Yeah. Don't even look lustfully at a woman. Here's the bar. No sex. Don't even think about it. <laughs> That's a higher bar. Isn't it? And I think it's why people so many times as Christians, we think that being a Christian means that God in a sense has relaxed the standards, when in a sense what he's saying is when I work inside of you, we're going to raise the bar. You can take things like um, thou shalt not murder. Don't kill anybody. Now I would think probably most of you are going to go through life and achieve this. You're going to keep that commandment. However, if your thought life was exposed, okay, you know, it, hateful thoughts, hurtful thoughts, you know, but that's what Jesus said. He says, even if you have hatred in your heart, what? You've murdered somebody. You see, when we sit there and we say, okay, we're going to, yes, I'm saved, but I'm going to really work hard at doing the Ten Commandments, and, okay, I didn't kill anybody, I haven't had sex outside of marriage, and we go down the Ten Commandments, all of a sudden, what do we do? We can start to feel a little bit of pride in ourselves. And God's sitting there saying, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Because this is about a transformation of your heart, mind, body, and spirit. It's not just a, a self-improvement thing where you're going to keep from making the big mistakes. That is not the goal of a Christian. Do you know that? So many Christians think that going through their Christian life is I just have to avoid the big mistakes. It has nothing to do with that. God wants our hearts to be right with Him. But the law is something that if we ever try to, in any way, shape, or form, meet it, or use it to feel good about ourselves or right with God, in reality, it just shows again how uh, far short we are of His standard, which is so far above us. It's actually the life of Christ. The Beatitudes is basically Jesus. Did you know that? It is. It described Him. Perfection in attitude, in action, in heart, in mind. And that's what we're being called to. And when we're justified, that's the way God looks at us. It's inconceivable. And so we need to live in that. We might not completely understand it, but once you live in it, things really, really start to evolve in your life as a Christian. But when you have a bad view of justification, it says there's a bad doctrinal view of justification. The most common bad view of justification is this. That in the Old Testament, people were saved or covered, like we talked about last week, by a system. We are systems people. Did you know that? People love systems. Orders. You know, one, two, three, four, five. They like those things. And so most Christians think, well, in the Old Testament, they had the Ten Commandments, and if they obeyed them and they sacrificed the animals, they were okay with God. And then they carry this thought about justification about the New Testament, that sins are covered by just praying a prayer. I pray a prayer, I ask God to forgive me, and my sins are forgiven. And so they view the New Testament as a streamlined, less restrictive, and simpler, easier system in the Old Testament. You get that? The Old Testament was a system that was hard and rigid, but for the Christian, many believe that what happens is that Christianity is now simply about this streamlined, less restrictive, simpler, and easier system. And if you fall prey to that view of justification that you're going to be made right just by coasting along, you don't understand what justification is, and you'll never feel right before God. Thinking like that is a heresy. What's a heresy? A heresy is an offensive lie. 
in the face of God's truth. That sounds pretty harsh. But the problem is that sometimes when we outline these things, you can find verses and thoughts that seem to support that heresy. But they don't understand the spirit of Christ and the heart of God and some of these other things that we've studied over the last few weeks. That's why studying doctrine can really be helpful. It helps you to understand. To sum it up, this heresy is to believe that before Jesus came, people were saved by hard work and compliance. What does God think of compliance? Not good. It's distasteful. And in the New Testament, we are saved by compliance that is superficial. So we must get back to what justification is. In Hebrews 10.8, it says this. This is the paraphrase. Old Testament sacrifices never appeased God. And in the New Testament, all the people that checked all the right boxes and think they've ticked all the right boxes, that is just as useless in God's eyes. Okay? Have you ever been in a time in your life where you felt like you were just ticking the boxes as a Christian? Yeah. Went to church, put the offering in, helped with this project, whatever it was, and you ticked the box? I should feel good about myself. But what ends up happening? You don't. Because it doesn't please God, and it doesn't do anything to improve who you are. All it will do is, again, reaffirm that in yourself there is really nothing that is that good. And so what happens is, is if you take a person who is trying to comply to the law or comply to Christianity to feel right, it doesn't work. And it's going to produce, I want you to hold on to these two words, legalistic anger. And have you ever faced that? Legalistic anger. That's a person, okay, that um, might have started out the beginning with good intentions, okay? They have a heart to do the right thing. They have a, a heart to obey God. But they try in their own strength and then they fail. And so what they do is they believe they're saved and that they're atoned for. But then, as miserable as they are, is they assume that now it is their job to make everybody else just as miserable as they are. That's what a legalist does. A legalist, I don't care who you are, if you have a pastor or a leader or a church that is legalistic and the leadership is legalistic, those people are miserable. They'll tell you that they're not while appearing and acting and sounding miserable. Okay? But you understand that when you sit there and say, I'm going to feel good, before God and feel justified because I obey these church tenets and these rules and things which are in the Bible. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't work for me. So then you conclude, well, it must not be that I, violating these things is the issue. I need to make sure other people are getting it right. And I'm going to be really hard and harsh and direct and overbearing on them. For what reason? Because I care about them. And I love them, and I want to serve God. And what are they doing in reality? Just the opposite, right? So do you understand where this legalistic anger comes from? Rob and I were talking about this today. You know, a lot of people that end up in legalism were people that started out on the right path. Good hearts, trying to accomplish something good. And maybe had a heart for righteousness, or had a, a heart for education, or whatever it is. And what happens is that all of a sudden, it became more about proving that they were right, and managing right and wrong, and imposing law on people. And none of those things are biblical principles. But at the beginning, they could have had a really good heart, but they just never embraced the love of God and feeling justified solely for who they were and for nothing that they did. And that legalistic anger might be in you. Because if you grow up with a legalistic person, and that you've experienced that anger, you might experience some of that yourself even though you don't want to. It's like the child that grows up in an alcoholic home and they say, I'm never going to become an alcoholic. And that some, sometimes many of them find out they have a, a tendency that way. And so if you have this legalistic anger, the way to deal with it is to look at yourself the way God looks at you after you're saved and stop trying to look at yourself through the lens of performance. Because if you do that, you're just going to get angrier and angrier and angrier. 
those three verses there, Romans 1 and Hebrews 10 and Galatians 11, all talk about that the only way to be declared just is a, is a just, and be, to be just and holy in God's eyes. Okay? That's the only way. Let me read that again. There is only one way to be declared just and a just and holy in God's eyes, and that is through the redeeming work of Christ. Okay? Now, justification is, and here's five words, that all, it's blank alone, blank alone, blank alone, blank alone. Justification, first of all, is by grace alone. Is by grace alone. God's love. Okay? There is no other way to be justified outside the love of God. Okay? Secondly, justification is by faith alone. If you don't believe in the justification provided by God through Jesus Christ, if you don't believe it, you can't be justified. Thirdly, it's by repentance or through repentance alone. You can't be justified if you refuse to leave sin behind you. You can't drag sin along with you when you come to God. If he's going to make you perfect in his sight, would it make sense to say, yeah, but I'd like to hold on to these things? It wouldn't make any sense, would it? Can you imagine standing before a judge and being acquitted of murder and you stand there with two guns in your pockets and he said, I need to give those up. You go, no, I really not. Really not. Not want to. You have to check your motives again. Number four, it's through Christ alone. It's not through the church. It's not through ordinances. It's not through confirmations and those kind of things. All of those things can be helpful. And justification glorifies God alone. The thing about justification you have to need to remember is when people look at you and they see anything good in you, who do they attribute it to? To Christ. Our lives should glorify God. So if people look at us and see anything good, we know our sinful nature and where we've come from and how undeserving we are, and people say, oh man, that was great, that was awesome, well, you're this, you're that, where do you get your patience from? How can you be so loving and all that kind of stuff? You sit there and say, God, He gets the glory when we're just before Him. If we glory in it, it discredits it. You know, people ask you, what is the best state to live in? Oh, North Carolina, New York, not, not New York, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> the best state to live in is justified. When you live in that, it just relaxes your life. All right, let's keep going. We talked about it before, about how C.S. Lewis talks about the great exchange. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, which we've read two or three times, it says this, God made him who had no sin, to become sin, what? That we might become the righteousness of God. Simply, our sin is imputed on Christ. Remember when we talked last week about the hand on the goat? The sin was imputed or put on the scapegoat? That's imputed, it was put on him. So our sin was put on Christ. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, now, this is the passage, remember, last week we talked about that is not in most Jewish texts and that they don't read. Isaiah 53, 5 talks about this judicial transfer of guilt from one thing unto another, from us unto Jesus. And it also describes the penalty that is also um, put on once that um, guilt has been put on. Listen to Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. But he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are what? Healed. Okay? That is a powerful passage of scripture. We don't take that passage seriously enough. That passion, every time it is read, should be read with passion. And should be read with almost a sense of overwhelming appreciation. But I've heard people read it and mumble through it. Read it without a sense of, of just incredible pain and a sense of appreciation. Whenever I hear this 
passage preached on, it almost always emphasizes the last line. And by his wounds we are healed. Now, there's a doctrine called healing in the atonement. And I believe that there's healing in the atonement. We're not going to get into that tonight. But I know people who read this passage of scripture and never talk about the first three lines of it. All they do is sit there and claim the healing that comes through atonement. So they make it solely a passage about healing. That is almost insulting the passage. Because sin had to be dealt with. He had to bear all of those things before what? He could heal us. Okay? A number of years ago, there was a, an ecumenical Christmas service in, in the town that Rob and I were living in. They asked me if I would read scripture. And uh, my initial thought was, this, you know, it's a hot, sticky Christmas play, you know. And I, I said, okay, I'll read it. And because they had, you know, the Catholic priest and the, the Methodist minister and the Episcopal pastor and the Baptist pastor and Brad. And um, <laughs> so I come in, they gave me a passage to read. It was, you know, part of the Christmas story. And, uh, you know, I appreciate my wife because I sat there and I said, honey, should I do this? She goes, of course you should do it. What a privilege. It is to read scripture in public. And I said, okay, thanks, Robin. And uh, so I said, you know what, I'm going to read this with, with passion. I'm going to read it the way it was written. So I got up and we're sitting through the service, you know, with the sheep over in the corner, pooping in the corner, and the kids dropping their staffs, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And so I get up to read my passage of scripture. I get up, open up my Bible, and I read it, and I sit down. But it was about, you know, about Christ and, you know, all that. So anyway, I got sick that night. And with my dizziness, I couldn't stay for the whole program, so I left right at the end. And I go home. The next night, we have a party at our house. Okay? Am I telling the truth? Okay? And a man who's one of the elders in that church comes up and he says, Oh, Brad, you sure caused a problem at church last night. <laughs> <laughs> what could I have done? I read a scripture. He goes, People didn't like that sermon you preached. Oh, no. <laughs> All I did was read the scripture with passion. And they thought it was that. Isn't that amazing? But I sat there and said, we can't take passages like Isaiah 53 and the death of our sin and what Christ went through on that cross and just not read it with passion and not focus in on it. He was wounded. He was pierced. He was crushed. Why? So you could be right with God. And I could be right with God. That is absolutely amazing. And then after that, it says that he imputed, what? His righteousness on us. That's the amazing part. He takes our sin in and he says, oh, you can have my right standing with God in exchange. That's a pretty good exchange. That's why C.S. Lewis is called, what? The Great Exchange. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says in the Amplified Bible, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, the atoning sacrifice that holds back the wrath of God, and not our sins alone, but the sins of the whole world. It's not just what he did, it's the scope of what he did as well. He didn't just justify me or you or a handful of people. He offered it to an entire creation and every person that ever lived. In 1 Timothy 3.16 it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Do you understand justification completely? That you're completely right in God's sight? You know, I don't. I can't conceive of it. It's a, Paul described it to Timothy. It's a mystery that God could look at me and think of me as godly. Then he goes on and says, God was manifest in the flesh. And then Jesus was justified in the spirit. Did you know that Jesus was justified so you could be? He was justified first. He took the sin. He died. He got rid of it. He rode again and in, the, in the face of God, in the face of the law, in the face of the Holy Spirit, in the face of the angels, and even four witnesses, Paul says, Jesus stood perfect in obedience to the law, and he dealt with sin, 
He's justified, and now he has the ability to distribute to the church. It, we don't think about him being justified, but he was. And so when you think about your justification, you're just simply getting a gift. It's not yours. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. Man, you better hold on to it. Okay? It says in 1 John 4.10, and this is a, one of my theme verses, when it talks about, it's not that we love God. What's the rest of the verse? But he first loved us and gave himself for us. To be a believer and to be atoned for and to stand justified, you cannot believe that God loved you in your sinful nature to bring you to that point and what he had to go through to do it. First love. I wrote a book called First Love, okay? And it was designed to take for parents and teenagers or small groups to sit down and to rediscover this love. The first love. Because when we understand how he loved us and that he first loved us and the course of that love that we studied over the last seven or eight weeks, then all of a sudden what we do is we begin to understand how monumental it is and then we start to love him the way that we should. And this next season of my life as I'm regaining my health and my strength, I'm starting to write first love two. Okay? Because the first love is about how to become a Christian. The second one is on revival. It is on how to live out an atoned, justified life and to live Christ-like in the power of what he teaches us. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 13, 14, and 15, it talks about that this atonement and this justification, when it's realized, okay, and that we are justified 100% only by Jesus Christ, by Jesus alone. There is no other element that, that uh, goes into our justification when we can understand that and walk in it. Paul said to the church of Colossae these four things. In verse 13, he said, This alone, Jesus alone, justification alone, is what makes you spiritually alive. Praying a prayer and accepting Jesus Christ into your heart is not what makes you truly alive. What makes you truly and fully alive in Christ is when you receive the atonement and you know your sins are paid for. And the Holy Spirit comes into your life and gives you that spirit of being justified. It's more than just getting your sins forgiven and going to heaven. Did you know that? And that's what we've reduced it to. Christianity is about walking, atoned for, and covered, and justified. That's living spiritually. And so many people think, it's just, well, my sins are forgiven, and I'm going to heaven. It's almost an insult, really, to when you really think about what Christ did. In verse 13, he says that justification alone provides lasting joy. It's the only joy that can last. And he says, because your trespasses are gone. What does it mean to trespass? You walk where you weren't supposed to go. I've been out in the woods with a few times with my brothers and we've gone on people's property that we didn't know or there was no signs posted or anything like that and all of a sudden you've got three dogs and a shotgun coming at you. Okay? And uh, get out of there as quick as you can. Trespassing can be a serious offense. Well, we've trespassed against God. And he basically says, done. It's gone. But only in Christ can your trespasses against God's territory and His law be forgiven. Thirdly, in verse 14, he says, in justification alone, and this, I want you to really listen to this, it wipes out the handwritten record against you. Did you ever think about that? There's a law. And when you break the law, it says here, the handwritten law, the Ten Commandments were handwritten originally. Did you know that? God took his finger and wrote them. When you read this text, it talks about handwriting. So there's a record there's a law and a record against us, and what Jesus did alone was kill that, erase it, get rid of it, burn it. It doesn't exist anymore. When you become a Christian, do you know that all of your sin is basically taken on a scroll and thrown into a fire and it's gone as far as the east is from the west? That's what it means. And then fourthly, when you're justified, because the law is dead, you can have assurance about the future. 
And the most important future for you is not tomorrow. Did you know that? Did you know that? The most important future for you is not this year. What's the most important future? When you stop breathing, that's what you need assurance about, right? When you know you're justified and all of these things have taken place, sin, death, punishment, and hell lose their power. And amen belongs there. <laughs> Z.B. Hill used to say, you've got to notify white folks where an amen belongs. <laughs> Glory be. <laughs> Sin is dead. Death is dead. Judgment is dead. Hell is dead to you. It does not exist. It is not a possibility. And if you imagine living like that, you can live what they describe Jesus as, as having an indestructible life. Because death isn't the end. So we go back to that question I asked you at the beginning. How do you know that you're a believer? It's not just as simple as I pray a prayer, and I made a confession, and I was baptized, and um, you know, I tried to be a good person. Okay. How do you know that you're a believer? Because you'll see the characteristics of being justified that we just reviewed active in your life. Now, they're not going to all be there at the beginning. You've got to learn and grow in them. And that's why we study, so we can learn and watch these things mature in our lives. But we can put it on a simplistic level. How do you know you are a believer? Because you find comfort and encouragement in your right standing with God. It's the simplest way to put it. You find comfort and encouragement in your right standing with God. Did you ever find comfort in that? Everything's going wrong, but man, I'm right with God. Things are going bad. Yeah, but I'm right with God. It's amazing how it has the ability to slip in and bring encouragement and joy to us. And then also, it says this, they can also provide peace of mind. Why? Because you've been vindicated. Okay? Vindicated means that in God's eyes you're off the hook. And I just want to put a little sidebar here. We as Christians want to be vindicated in this world. Give that up. Being vindicated means being proved right. Okay? You ever had anybody hurt you unjustifiably, say something unjustifiable about you? do something to you that was wrong, and it's deeply hurt you, it's racked your life, it's really hurt you, and you just cry up to heaven, and you don't say it, but like, come on, God, vindicate me. I'm not in the wrong here. God says, just wait. You are vindicated in my eyes, and that's all that matters. And I'll tell you, I've gone through a couple seasons in my life, and Robin can do a test to it, where we had somebody that was in a long-term relationship with our, us and our ministry, and we loved them, and all of a sudden, something we did, we don't even know exactly what it was, offended this person. All of a sudden, I get a four-page nasty letter. Anybody that's in the ministry, don't keep those, burn them, okay? And um, it was just boom, 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 boom. And Robin and I were on a trip, remember this? to England, we were flying on a plane to Chicago, and she got violently sick on the plane, was throwing up and passed out on the plane. I had to carry her from the plane to a wheelchair, right? We had to go to a hospital. I had to walk into, or not a hospital, a hotel. I had to walk into a hotel carrying my wife like this. Okay, I lay her down in bed. I am exhausted, and I wasn't feeling great at that time, and that's when I get this email from this lady. Oh, Jesus. And I said, that's what I said. Oh, Jesus. Okay. And, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm going, oh, come on. You realize the timing of this. And I went outside, and I was crying, because I was just so at the end. And I sat there, and I just said, Lord. And I can't remember which psalm it was. I forgot to look it up. But the Lord just said, open the word. And I opened up, and I read one of the psalms, and, and David said, but the Lord will vindicate. And it was amazing. It didn't end the hurt and the pain, but I just realized it doesn't matter right and wrong here. I was hurt, but I know, and we've since made up with this lady, actually, but that God, I was right before him, 
And when we're right with God in our state, it doesn't mean we don't make mistakes and hurt people, but when we're right before God and we're vindicated before God, we can recover when we don't get justice in this world. And for some of you, you carry around a big injustice in your life, and you feel like, oh, just let it go, and you are vindicated before God. You're just before Him and right before Him. In the courtroom, no charges will be brought against you. Now down below that, it says yuck. That was the opening words to a sermon I heard in South Dayton back in the, was that the 80s, right? the 90s? Yeah, that was in the 90s. 90s. Uh, it was a Good Friday service, community service. Late 80s. Okay, and then we had a group of pastors there, and they asked one of the pastors, who well, I really don't think knew the Lord. Uh, he was to give the Good Friday address because they rotated it. This is how we started Good Friday. The blood of Jesus. Yuck. Oh. And I'm going, this, this is not going to be good. <laughs> not on any level. He could not understand the importance of blood on Good Friday. Wow. But there's a lot of people that don't. They just don't understand. Blood is gross. Blood is messy. You know, the crucifixion is a gruesome thing. But when you, you understand how when you understand it from the right perspective, it's beautiful. But if you don't understand it from the right perspective, it can really mess with your thinking. Okay? We have to see the beauty in all of that, and the sacrifice in it, and the love in it. But when I sat there and I heard him start the sermon, yuck. I just remember sitting there. It's one of those times in my life I go, I don't know if I did the right thing or the wrong thing and not saying anything. I felt like standing up and saying, excuse me, I, I can't do that. And then he administered communion. We have to understand the beauty and all of what Christ went through because the beauty of it and the ugliness of it is what translates us into the beauty of being atoned and justified. It says down below that, a contemporary, a contemporary heresy. There's some people who think that they can be justified simply by doing good things. Another bad perspective on justification is this. I'm justified, and therefore God excuses the rest of my sins. Because when you're justified, you know God justifies the sins of your past, your present, and your future. They're all made right with God because of Him. So some people have adopted the theology of this. Well, my sins are forgiven. I'm right before God, so it doesn't matter how I live. I'm not going to take time to read Romans chapter 3, if you believe that. And in verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, he says, Should we sin so that God's grace can abound? God forbid! I would be saying, you've got to be kidding me. Can you imagine all that we've talked about in standing before God? And God says, you're innocent before me. Charges are removed. They don't exist. You're right before me. And you go, great, now I can do whatever I want. Does that sound right to you? Does it sound logical? Does it sound like the person experienced what God had just said or done? So I said, as below that, can we, if we are justified, live the way we want? Yes. Yes. You can. If you've been redeemed and transformed and God's Spirit has control of you and you're justified and atoned for, you're going to want the right thing. So live the way you want. There's freedom, isn't there, in God? We look at it the exact opposite way. God says that when I remake you and you grasp this and my Spirit fills you, you can live life the way you want because you're going to want to live it the right way. It's a beautiful principle. We can't live it the way we want when what happens? The sinful nature is in control. Or we've got messed up thinking. If we're justified and atoned for it, you can get up and walk away and you're going to be doing the right things by nature and having the right attitudes and approaching things the right way. I still remember Dave and I were walking down the road at uh, Red Hill, which is a retreat center in England. And we were talking, he says, you know, Red, what I love about being a Christian? I go, you know what, Dave? And he goes, you don't have to make any decisions. Think about that. 
If it's right or wrong, the decision's already made, right? The decisions have been made, and if we're in the spirit and we're right, the there's no choices. We just do the right thing by impulse because of that. And when we do make a mistake or we do blow it, our justified spirit just quickly resolves it and deals with it and goes right back to God and makes it right. So can we live the way we want? Yeah. If you have a new heart and a new mind and a new soul and a new spirit and a new position and a new owner. Because God becomes your owner. And then after God has atoned you and made you just, then he can help you stay clean. This is a whole new doctrine called sanctification, which we're not going to talk about today. Okay? I'm going to just give you a real brief explanation. Atonement means that God made you clean. Justification is that God declared you clean. And sanctification is God's ability to help you live clean. It's that simple, okay? So get it again. Atonement is where God made you clean. Remember the covenant? Okay. Then secondly, justification, what we've talked about tonight, is where God declares you clean. But sanctification is God's ability to help you live clean. Now, as long as we live in this world, are we ever going to get it perfect? No. No. Okay? But inside... Your heart and your mind is viewed right with God. And the Holy Spirit then spends our lives in learning and growing and discipling and helping us to let that show more on the outside. It's like sanctification is like a bath. We have to continually take baths. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. In Romans 6.19 it says, Work hard to present your members as slaves to righteousness and not slaves to sin. The old Celtic um, Christians, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, every part of their day was in prayer. And so when they got out in the morning, they brushed their teeth and they would ask God to cleanse their mouth. When they washed their hair, they'd ask God to help them put on the helmet of salvation. When they washed their hands, they'd say, God, keep me clean today. And they'd wash their entire body, even their private parts, and dedicate those to God. We're supposed to, when we're just before God, saying, you got every part of me right now. So I want you to help me stay clean. And I'm telling you, you can't stay clean on your own. And it's absolutely stupid to sit there and say, okay, okay, God, I'm just before you. Great, I got this. Now I'm going to live life perfectly, and I'm going to please you. What's he say? Well, good luck with that one. <laughs> but what he is going to say is, okay, now that you're right, live in that rightness. And when you do fail, when you do make mistakes, don't worry about your standing with me. That hasn't changed but we need to work on cleaning up and help the relationship get back to where it once was. You want to read a great passage on this. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9, 10, and 11. He said, you know, at one time, you guys were prostitutes, homosexuals, murderers, swindlers, liars. But he says, you once were these things. It's in the past tense. You are not these things any longer. And so when a person becomes a Christian, one of the ways they know that they're a Christian is they're different in some ways or sometimes completely from the person they used to be. But I've known people who've become Christians and actually become worse. We can know that we're believers because we see God transforming our lives and changing our lives. And of course we go through seasons where sometimes it's stronger than it is in other seasons. But one of the beauties is if you're struggling with your relationship with God right now and living a holy and pure life, go back to what he did for you, who you are in his sight, and start there. And then to say, okay, God, I know you've covered me. I'm forgiven in your sight. I know I'm right in your sight and have been declared sight. Now help me to walk in it. Help me to know how to do that. Give me the strength and the power to do it, and he will do it. All right? We're going to review here. Believe it or not, there has actually been a sequence to these lessons that we've been teaching. Okay? I just didn't randomly pick, you know, eight doctrines. I sat there, I prayed for a long time, Lord, what order do you want these in? And which ones do you want me to teach and not teach? And I want to show you how 
the lessons before this have led up to tonight. Okay? Okay, first of all, the first lesson we talked about was the importance between life and doctrine. I want you to listen to this statement. I want you to really lock onto this statement. Okay? The Christian life is about turning untested beliefs into unshakable truths. That's what the Christian life is. The Christian life is about turning untested beliefs into unshakable truths. So, are we going to discover things about God that we didn't know before? And we choose to believe it. But believing it isn't enough. It has to become a truth to us. That's what discipleship is. That's what maturing is. So there is a connection between life and doctrine. We discover what is true, but you've got to translate it into a truth of your life. Then we talked about the doctrine of the Bible. We said the Bible is alive. It's a living thing. Okay? It's sharp. It's alive. And so when we talk about justification, it's about the Word of God living inside of us and having the effect that a holy Word would have inside of us. It kills things. It stabs things. It cuts things off. It cuts things away. It does surgical procedures. It works inside of us. For what purpose? To justify us. Okay? Thirdly, then we talked about the attributes of God. If you're going to understand having a right standing with God, you need to understand the God that you're standing before. And I think one of the things that has been lost in our culture is people don't know the attributes of God. So when they accept God, they don't even know who they're standing before. And so they don't know what's the proper way to respond or to come into the presence of a God who's all of these things. All they think is, is that God's a loving God who forgives me and basically is really lenient. Well, that's pretty far from what we've discovered in the attributes of God, isn't it? And then fourthly, we studied the person of Jesus Christ. What do we say Jesus Christ? He runs as a scarlet thread for what? From Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. And when Jesus came, we could see God and we could hear his voice. He reconciled us and last week he atoned us. So if he's run all the way through that, now we can trust that he's going to justify us. It's just a natural sequence. Okay? We talked about the sinful nature of man. Can you understand that if you really get a grasp of these truths that we've been talking about, you really understand the sinful nature that's inside of you, and you put those things together, you're going to become a Christian real quick. You're going to repent real quick. You're going to make your life right real quick when you can grasp those things. But if you put them out of sight and out of mind, that's why a lot of times people, they think that they're better than they are. Here's the sinful nature, but they think they're better than that. And God's image is up here, but they've lowered it down here. What's happened to the distance between them and God? It's become less, right? We need to have such a transcendent view of God and such a realistic view of ourselves that we sit there and we see that great chasm and just go, man. That's why we talk about the sinful nature. Then we talked about the gospel. The key verse was Romans 1.16, which it says the gospel is what? The power of God unto God. What? Salvation. Okay? The gospel, the message of the gospel, the gospel itself, the story of Christ's redemption, is the power in our lives. And so it has the power to save us. Does it have the power to justify us? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so the same power that raised Christ from the dead, that covered our sin, is the same power that can work in you and give you right standing before God. And a lot of Christians say, well, I have God has the power to forgive me and atone for my sins, and I believe that, but I don't really think he's got the power to make me into a person that looks and acts and talks like Jesus. You're cutting off all that you've learned up till the night if you believe that. It's exciting when you sit there and go, I could live like that? I could live a life that's honoring to God? I could change? God could transform me? It's just taking that power and watching it continue to work out your salvation, improve your salvation, strengthen your salvation, then last week we talked about the atonement. And all that meant was to be made right with God. Do you understand how you have to be made right with God before you can stand just before God? So, you made your right through the atonement, and now you're justified. And now that you're justified, wow, here's the thing that produces assurance. Promises become guarantees. Gives you security. 
provides you insurance against death. And to put it in the simplest terms I could come up with, look at justification as the new soil that God has put in your heart. Up until now, until you become a Christian, it's dirty and it's hard and it's rocky and it's not productive. But when you're justified, it's a perfect soil. And then what happens when God plants something in that soil? It grows. It grows and grows and grows. So understanding your right standing with God and having that heart and having that justification churn, you know, churn up the soil of your heart then gives God the potential. And that will sit there and say, all right, let's go. Let's do this. Let's live the life. Next week we're going to talk about God as Father. But I'm not done yet. We'll be done in like five minutes or so. Don't believe me, I'll just say that. But I want you to put your pens down. I don't want anybody to write anything down. I want you to stop listening with your ears and listen with your spirit. Okay? I have summarized what we've talked about tonight in a writing. It's a short one. And I just want you to listen to it. If you want a copy of this later, Linda, we can get a copy to him somehow, okay? Or if you want to talk to him later. I don't want you writing down. I don't want you sitting from home, oh, you know, like that. I just want you to listen, because this is talking about justification. You know, it's interesting. We bow our heads and close our eyes when we should be looking, okay? And we look when we should have our eyes closed. I'm asking, unless you're really tired, Close your eyes so you can listen and, and shut everything else out. But you know, in prayer, there's very few instances of people bowing their head and closing their eyes. That's a man-made tradition, generally. Okay. But what I'm saying is now is, you listen with your spirit, listen with your heart. Don't engage your mind so much. And just let God take the message of justification and apply it to your heart and to your spirit. Okay? So there we go. Just listen. You are atoned for by the blood of Christ. Every sin is covered. You are justified and blameless before God. And it's time for you to take this truth and apply it to your life. You came to God saying, just as I am, your sinful nature. And you came to a just God. You were then examined by a just law. And Christ appeased the justice of God through the cross. And by faith, you now stand just before God. So tonight, you can say this. I am just standing here. Not, I am just standing here. With confidence, you can say, this is how God, my Father, the just judge, views me. Through Christ, my guilt is settled and done. Only what he thinks about me matters. So when Satan comes and accuses me of recent sins I have committed, I respond, Jesus Christ has already pled and won my case. And in Christ's court, there is no double jeopardy. Double jeopardy is when it says, No person shall be tried for the same offense twice, putting in jeopardy their life, limb, or freedom. You can say, When Jesus atoned me and covered me with his blood, it was once and for all. The Son has already pled my case. The Spirit now testifies on my behalf, and the law of God has already been met for my benefit. I cannot be tried again. Repeat that before God right now. I cannot be tried again. I cannot be tried again. I cannot be tried again. Remember that. I cannot be tried again. And when it comes to who I used to be in the past, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people think or what crowds think or people yell at me. 
It doesn't matter that the enemy is constantly saying guilty, 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 guilty. It doesn't matter that he's constantly saying to me, yeah, but he's not perfect, he's not perfect, she's not perfect, she's not perfect. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter what you did today. It doesn't matter what you did an hour ago. In God's sight, you're just. But you can proclaim this. I was guilty. I admit it. The penalty that I deserved was capital punishment. I know that. I should die for it. And there are thousands of pieces of indisputable evidence that prove me guilty. And I have had plenty of legitimate witnesses to my sins over my entire life. And Satan has tormented me with that. He was like a determined prosecutor seeking my punishment and to put me in prison for life. But Jesus threw a big red robe over all the mound of the evidence of my sin. And God the Father now looks at this evidence covered with the blood of Jesus and says, it's inadmissible to me. My son Jesus on the cross paid your every ticket, your every charge, your every fine. He covered every law you broke, every offense you did, every crime you committed, even the illegal things you did in this world, past, present, and future. God through Jesus says, I declare you innocent. And all charges are not only dismissed, but they're stricken from your permanent record. And when Satan or my conscience says, but he said this, she said this, Jesus says it's forgotten. When my conscience says, yeah, but you did this, the Spirit says it's erased. When I hear, yeah, but you broke this law and you violated this law and you couldn't live up to the standard, God says it's already been met. When you've stolen something, he said he'll repay it. When you've lied, you stand in the truth. When you broke his commands, God says, the penalty for that's been appeased. When people in your conscience says, you deserve death, you deserve to be punished for what you did, the Father says, not anymore. Yeah, but we still sin, we still fail. God even says, I've got that covered too. God says, you have already been tried and pardoned by the blood of Christ. And again, there is no double jeopardy. Christians, remember you are right with God. But someday, the judge will turn around to your accuser and say, okay, it's your turn to stand trial. Face the law. Face the accusations. And every charge is going to stick to him. And the punishment will be enforced. There will be no leniency. The law will be appeased. And Satan will have no plea or even a chance to defend himself. And witnesses against him will abound. There will be the testimony of my word and my law and my angels and even my people. And the ones who accuse you and me are going to be standing there. In that day, God will say to the accuser, I am just. My people are just. Standing here, covered and right. But you stand here, naked and uncovered and guilty. So my Christian family, you are atoned. You are just in God's sight. But remember this, your forgiveness and you're just standing with me. This is never to be used as an excuse to sin. Never. But rather, if you are justified, let it be a motivation not to sin. Let it be the power to resist sin. Let it be the reason you will avoid sin. Let it be the provision for you to escape sin. Let it be the way to get around sin. Let it be a reminder of the cost of sin. Let it be the call to die to sin. 
Let it be a privilege that you've been removed from sin. Let it be the incentive for you to separate from sin. And let it be the mindset that you're free from sin. Listen, we were all the woman caught in sin and thrown down at Jesus' feet, surrounded by stone throwers. But Jesus said, your five affairs, they're forgiven. The past life of your sin is gone. Woman, where are your accusers? They're gone. And Jesus looked at that woman and said, you're just in my sight. But he also said what? Now go and sin no more. Friends, you are just before God. Through your faith in Jesus Christ and his blood to atone for your life and sins. So avoid sin. Don't put stones back into the hands of people by returning to the past. Don't egg on Satan to accuse you by living as if you weren't justified, atoned, and forgiven. And don't return to the places and the people and the passions that in the past have left you on your knees, guilt-ridden, embarrassed, defeated, feeling worthless, naked, and uncovered. Remember, you are not just standing here tonight, but you are standing here just tonight before God. You are standing just before God and His people. And so as people of God, just simply remember, in your sinful nature you came to Jesus just as I am. And you found Him just as He was. And you were made just by His blood on the cross. And you were declared just by His Father. And you were justified by the Spirit. So declare this over yourself. I don't, I don't just stand here before God. I stand here just before God. I don't stand here, just stand here before God. I stand here just before God. One more time. I don't just stand here before God. I stand here just before God. Lord, if we could swim in this for a while, soak in it for a while, and live in it for a while, it would become a fertile ground for our lives, our families, our church, our marriages, for the community. So Father, let us live just in your sight. And we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Your homework assignment is easy. I want you to write on your hand. If you don't want to write on your hands, if you have a problem with that, you can write on the card. Okay, I stand here just. Okay? I stand here just, period, before God. I stand here just before God. Do you understand the difference between the phrase, I stand here just before God, and I stand here just, period, before God? And so when you are accused, when you fail, when you're discouraged, when you feel like you can't go on, I stand here just before God. Next week we're going to talk about the Father part of God. And uh, I love this topic. It's a great topic. And all of the things that we've talked about in these first numbers of weeks is just simply because you have a father who loves you. Did you know that? This is all the love of a father. The whole story is the story of Christ. That's the scarlet thread, but it's also the story of a God who loves you. Okay? And next week we're going to examine what does that mean. When I uh, travel to England, it is the number one topic that I'm asked to talk about. You know, when I sit in a room with about 25 or 30 or 40 college-age students and we talk about their fathers, it's hard. It's really hard. You have so many people that come from difficult situations with their father. And having and coming to an understanding of God as Father and what that means can heal so much. And we've seen literally people that have come out of abuse or come out of being orphaned 
or have been left or something like that, come into a vibrant relationship with God, the Father has moved past those things. Find forgiveness for the Father. Some of them even have led their fathers to the Lord later on in life. Okay? So I want you to think about this week when you're thinking about that just standing. Yes, you're just before God, but you're also just before your Father. We're going to talk about His loving heart, but we're also going to talk about the fact that He's a loving God, and that means that sometimes He has to be a firm Father, or He has to be a direct Father, or He has to be a Father that uh, disciplines you. But it's all based on the fact that He is a perfect Father with a perfect heart and perfect love for you. So I just pray that this week you can go, and when things get tough, just look down at your hand and go, I'm just before God. I'm just before God. And I tell you, put, put it on your refrigerator, put it on your office, put it in your Bible or whatever, but just repeat that statement. That's your homework assignment for this week. So God bless you, and we'll see you for the last week next week. God bless you.